So uh, hello and welcome everyone. Um, and thank you all for coming out to today's um, live theory set, uh, theory lab lecture um, by Gerd Kempermann, who's going to talk to us about adult uh, neurogenesis today. Um, for those of you who don't know, the live theory lab is a lecture series that's part of the International Max Planck School Life um, that was organized by Ulman Lindenberger, Markus Werkle Wagner, and um, Imke Kruse. Um, my name is Nico Schuck. I'm a researcher at the Max Planck Institute in Berlin, and I'm also happy to welcome our panelists today, um, Sarah Polk, Colleen Frank, and Tanya Bermudis, who, whom you can see on the screen. Um, Sarah will introduce our speaker in just a minute, um, but before we can get started, I wanted to um, remind everyone of a few um, rules for today's session. The first rule is that um, please uh, mute your mics. There are a lot of people here and the background noise that you might have in your apartment can disturb everyone um, watching the lecture series. Um, if you have questions, um, post them in the question box. We will answer questions in the end after the talk. Um, and if you can't unmute your mic, uh, someone will call you up and unmute, unmute your mic for you, some of the organizers. Um, I should also remind you that the lecture series is going to be recorded uh, and put on the internet afterwards. So if you do not want to be part of that recording, do not ask a question. Otherwise, your voice will be part of the recording. Um, Finally, uh, for those of you who don't know, it's a tradition of the graduate school life that in the question session is always be opened by the graduate students of the school. Um, so we will first go through all the questions by the PhD students and then we will open the questions to the general audience. Um, the talk will last about 45 minutes and then we have about 30 minutes for questions. And with that, I'll hand over to Sarah. Okay, yeah, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Gerd Kampermann from the Center for Regenerative Therapies in Dresden. Um, and he'll be, as Nico said, he'll be giving a talk about adult neurogenesis and individuality. Um, so Professor Kempermann received his medical doctorate from the University of Freiburg and worked as a clinical neurologist before completing his habilitation at the Humboldt University in 2001. He was then a junior group leader at the Max Delbrück Center until 2007 and has since then been a professor of genomics of regeneration at the Center for Regenerative Therapies and is also a speaker and research group leader at the DZNE and I think the full name in English is the German Center for Neurodegenerative Diseases, um, also in Dresden. Um, he's also been a faculty of life since uh, 2004, and you probably read his paper titled Emergence of Individuality in Genetically Identical Mice. This is pretty much required literature for all of his fellows. Um, and yeah, so Kempevan's research focus most, sorry, research focuses include neuronal, neuronal stem cells and adult neurogenesis, uh, development of inter-individual differences, resilience to age-related losses through both physical and cognitive activity, particularly in animals, um, and all of this from a neurobiological perspective. So I'm really looking forward to this lecture today. Thank you so much for being with us virtually. Uh, the webinar is all yours. Great, thank you, Sarah. So should I start or is there anything else that uh, needs to be done before? No, just go ahead. Then we go ahead. Well, thanks uh, for the, this invitation and for the nice introduction. It's, uh, it's really a pleasure to be uh, live uh, again. Um, I haven't been for any event uh, lately, so it's, 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 it's good. And it's great that we have this uh, opportunity to do this um, internationally. Um, yeah, I want to talk to you um, about um, um, individuality from a neurobiological perspective. And, um, first introduce you to um to the background uh, why uh, we are interested um in this so these are concepts um that that you or many of you will be um, aware of um because you might come across them in the context of life uh, occasionally and um they go by different brand names uh, of uh, the cognitive reserve the brain reserve or the neural reserve uh, brain maintenance uh, these are three 
names. Um, they're not identical, but uh, they have an overlapping uh, topic. Um, and the, it's, it's usually meant as um, indicating that um, there is a discrepancy between uh, how a person, um, how the, the quality of the cognitive abilities of a person is and what he or she is supposed to be according to her age. So there is a delta and um, this delta is, is, is interesting because it suggests that there is potential in the brain to better cope with uh, the problems of aging. And um, in our institute here, we are interested in neurodegenerative diseases and um, the impact that they have on, uh, uh, on our lives and what we could do against them. And as you know, there's, there's very little we can actually do. There's no drug or any other treatment that would help against Alzheimer's disease. But on the other hand, there are these concepts like cognitive reserve or um, the like that um, at least tell us there is something that somehow creates a gap between where you're supposed to be by statistics and where you really are. And um, the idea of our work here is to exploit this opportunity. Um, to, to, to find um, the neurobiological basis of this uh, gap. And um, this concept um, of, of the neural reserve, um, it hasn't been invented by Jakob Stern, whom you see in this picture here, um, but, but he's one of the, the champions of this idea, and he was one of the first people who really phrased it into a relatively coherent um, um, hypothesis. And from the perspective that we are taking, it's, it's like looking at the problems of um, cognitive aging and problems of um, neurodegenerative disease with the perspective of the half full rather than the half empty glass. So the the idea that um, that that uh, depending on on what you do on your lifestyle on on your behavior can add something to such reserve such um, potential. Uh, for compensation or for delay um, of the disease is is of course not new and it's um, it has been you know, first it has been around for quite some time and um, it, it's also very commonly uh, uh, propagated yeah? you only have to pick up the, the this magazine at the pharmacy uh, shop and you to see that uh, there's all kinds of good tips and even the WHO has issued guidelines last year on uh, how you could reduce your risk uh, for cognitive decline and um, dementia based on lifestyle uh, interventions. And um, here we go at uh, some detail. We can uh, look here. Um, what are these? Uh, first is uh, don't drink too much. Alcohol is meant here. In the case of uh, dementia, you have this interesting curve, which everybody always likes and talks at uh, being, don't, don't drink any alcohol is also not good in the case of dementia, but um, there is this uh, U-shape. The margin is not that big, uh, but, but it's, it's, uh, it's not like in other cases, uh, cancer or so, where there's a relatively linear relationship with the risk, so a little of trade-off what you want to get but but yeah don't drink too much alcohol exercise regularly don't smoke manage your blood pressure maintain a healthy weight eat a balanced diet and you will say oh wow hey who you you really came up with interesting new uh, new ideas we have never thought of that and that's that's the surprising thing, that uh, these are things that have been around forever as lifestyle recommendations for pretty much anything that you can come up with in terms of health. Um, these are the same things, or pretty much the same things, that you would uh, recommend somebody to um, prevent cancer, to maintain cardiovascular health, and so on. It's, it's, it's a very general recommendation. And if you think about this, it becomes 
a bit weird that this should be the case. Why, on one side, of course, it tells you that being healthy is healthy. Yeah, great. But the question then is why, or first we have to ask if there is any specificity behind this. Well, one thing to realize is that, of course, such rules, um, that's recommendations that are given out, like here in this case by WHO, they are those that, that are really on the top, uh, on, on, on the top of the, um, uh, uh, of the statistics. So, so the, the, where the evidence has, uh, has really strong support and uh, if there is a Cochrane review on something then you know meta-analyses and everything they have shown is really strong. But um, that of course doesn't mean that there couldn't be other things that are interesting and relevant in this context. And so I, I've looked through the literature and, and uh, really manually um, selected um, all the papers that um, tell us something with some scientific quality um, about things that are good for the brain in this context. And, and, and you see this uh, list um, arranged in the circle here. And I've, I've organized them according to this um, four quadrants, um, diet, education, exercise and purpose, and these labels are only meant as, as anchor points so that one has an idea of what's in these, uh, in these um, quadrants, but then arranged all these different things around and what, what you immediately see is that, oh, there is um, there's quite a bit um, of such factors. Um, and, and second, that these WHO recommendations, they all cluster on this left side and mostly on the upper half in this uh, D quadrant. So if we look at this a bit more detailed, then what is the organization principle? It's, it's um, a four field uh, uh, of a four quadrant matrix that is uh, spanned out by body and main, mind uh, on the columns and input and output on the, uh, on the, um, on the rows. And um, the idea then is that um, these uh, things, the li these lifestyle related factors, they, they stand in some relationship to each other. They are, they, are, they are not all addressing these questions from the same angle. They are sort of between physical and mental self and social energy, information, quantity, quality on one axis, uh, receiving and giving, being influenced, influencing. Passivity, activity, subject, object, and the and the other. And you could come up with more. They are not exclusive, uh, and they are not strictly orthogonal here. But they describe a certain field of 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 tension that 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 is here. So that means that um, what we know about what is good for the brain is um, is 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 really way way more than uh, uh, these um, high power. Uh, or statistical high power recommendations um, as in this uh, WHO. But there is one aspect to it which, uh, which does not really shine through any of these lists and that is that we, we tend to value um, things differently. And um, there's, there's various sorts of um, these uh, Maslow type uh, pyramid of, of, of values that we assign to certain things. Right, but but the, the 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 principle is always that that we have um, a feeling for this um, hierarchy of things that are very physical at the basis, and that we move up uh, towards more spiritual and transcending um, uh, um, perspectives. And if you project this uh, this pyramid uh, uh, type on, onto this um, this scheme, then you realize well. This diet, uh, this uh, area where all these um, highly documented um, um, recommendations are, this is really the the, the, the physical parts, uh, very very basic in a way. Whereas in this lower left quadrant, we have where the purposes, where these these more human uh, um, qualities, um, the things that uh, that are very difficult to grasp. Uh, 
examples were religious life and social engagement and uh, all these kinds of things um, that um, are much harder to, to grasp in, 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 in studies. Um, they, they don't they don't shine up uh, in, in, in these recommendations. So, so that means that when we look at, at these recommendations, what is what is really measured and becomes uh, apparent in the statistics is not the same of what is done. So the recommendations that push this always towards uh, education, exercise, but you have to do something. Um, but there is something missing in, 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 in most of these studies. And uh, the point of this uh, schematic then is that the there is actually something missing, and that is due to the fact that we have these tensions, these fields, these relationships between things that are very basic and very advanced, very physical and very spiritual, very outgoing and incoming. And this is then what is really meant. And so the question then is, what is it that um, is in the middle of this? What is what is it that glues this all together? Is there something that is a um, G factor in, uh, in, 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 in this world as well. So having all this complexity, can we move from reducing complexity just by biasing it towards one side of the things that are easily measurable towards a perspective that tries to capture essential parts of that complexity? Well, that's of course a, a big aim, and I, I don't know uh, how far we will get with this, but the idea that, that we are now pursuing is to, to find ways of, of modeling that complexity, of understanding that complexity in a very reductionistic system, so that we might not understand what exactly marital status and environmental toxins and balance training and artistic activities uh, do to promote uh, uh, successful aging and cognitive uh, uh, reserve and, and, and so on, but that we might understand some very fundamental principles about this G factor like uh, uh, things that, that that keep this together. So in our research, which is mostly on mice, we have some human research, but mostly we work on mice, we, have, we cannot really access a quality of life uh, or happiness uh, or things that, that might be in the center, but we can look at other homeostatic um, uh, uh, factors. And um, this is the idea of, of, um, of our research. And um, the from an animal research perspective, there has been a, a, a paradigm around for many, many years, um, essentially that the late uh, 1940s, which is called enriched environments, which by extension also exists uh, in, in, in human literature, you might come across it, but it's really a, an extension of a, a, a translation of that old uh, concept that has been developed um, or first been introduced by Donald Hepp um, as a response to behaviorism and we are trying to understand what happens um, in the brain um, and with the idea that there is more to, to these processes than just a input-output um, relationship that can be um, understood like a reflex. And an enriched environment in this uh, animal literature, this is a picture from an old cage as they had been used in, the, in, in these early studies here with, with rats in this cage, um, is, um, has been an extremely successful paradigm, very straightforward paradigm. And uh, one of the pioneers of this field, Marion Diamond, she has uh, um, um, summarized this in this wonderful book of hers, um, which is called Enriching Heredity. And um, the idea um, in that uh, book and this whole field um, has been that um, you, you study with the help of this uh, very simple paradigm the impact of environment on the brain. So, so this is this um, the the idea, and if you 
field. Well, the idea is, um, uh, of course, a phenotype uh, is, uh, that's a, the rule that, that, that you learn in biology, the phenotype equals the genotype plus or multiplied by the uh, environment. Um, you can find both versions, it's also not a literal uh, mathematical formula. And the idea of the classical enrichment paradigm is that you study the phenotype while keeping the genotype constant. You can do that in animal research because you have inbred animals and they are genetically essentially identical. So when you have those uh, animals in your experiment, you can be sure that everything that happens has to have some environmental component. And the, 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 the setup is very easy. You have a control group that lives in middle standard housing conditions, normal cage, uh, nothing special. They're not treated badly, not at all. Um, that's important. You don't want to stress them. You don't want to, it shouldn't be bad, um, but it's, uh, it, it's not as nice as in the enrichment as you see on the other side. So there's more mice in there. There's more space, more change and more stuff. So more, more things to interact um, with. And um, this is then, uh, in, in, in this classical analysis, considered a um, change over some baseline. So, so that's important. It's a, it's a model that, uh, is, that looks at relative change. And um, so, so the non-stimulated uh, control is considered a, a, a baseline. And you can, in fact, show that if you stress animals or so, so don't treat them as nice, then you get a negative effect that, that goes below baseline. So it's, it's um, uh, the, the point here is that, that you would like to have a relatively neutral baseline. And, and then you, you, you study improvements above that, that, uh, um, that baseline. And, um, oops, sorry. And, um, in, in, in the study, uh, in the classical uh, way of using the enriched environment, it's a cross-section analysis between group, between group and, and, uh, comparisons between these uh, two um, uh, housing conditions. And um, historically, there, there have been very few um, examples of where people have really looked at uh, within group comparisons um, in, 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 in this paradigm. And what I'm going to show you today is um, that, that we are working on, on moving this whole paradigm into a longitudinal paradigm and a multivariate paradigm and um, looking longitudinally at within group comparisons. But before, let's, let's have a look at this classical paradigm because there's some interesting things. So this is just behavioral, gross behavior, nothing, nothing special. You look at locomotion here and uh, locomotion in the open field and locomotion in the not novel object recognition task. So it's just uh, animals in a, in a large cage. You put them in there, you measure how much they move around. So not a big uh, deal. And um, what you see is um, when you look at the, the, the controls, uh, always in this um, blue and the, uh, the enriched in this um, enriched, uh, the enriched in this yellow tone, you can see that there are group differences. Right? You, you, there, there, and you also there, see it in the statistics uh, below. Um, there is this difference. So on the first day, the enriched move more, and on the second day, then which move less, they get a bit, they, get, they habituate faster. This is something you can find throughout the literature. It's, it's very, very common. Um, same here, habituation differs between these two groups. So there are these mean differences uh, and, and you can look at lots of different things here. Again, uh, rotor rod, um, uh, that's, that's a test where you put animals on a rotating rod and uh, you measure time until it takes fall off. So it's a, it's a balance test and motor skill test. Um, it's a very sensitive test uh, that has very low specificity for anything. What you can see is that if you have lived in an enriched environment, you're doing much better on this uh, task, uh, but there's a learning curve in both um, conditions, um, but the enriched stay ahead of the others. 
But now there is an interesting detail here. And that is when you look at the statistics below, you can see it already. And if you simply look at the figure, you can already see it. Look at the second day. You can see that um, the, the range of values for these uh, for the mice and the control group is much, much lower than for the con for the for the enriched. And 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 you can look throughout and, and, and by and large this is the same throughout. So and this is what the Brown Forsyth test uh, means. It's sort of statistics of the of, of, of the variance, um, and, and you compare the variances. And that's also statistically significant in this. So that means that variant, there, there is an effect on the mean and on the variance. And that was one of our initial observations that we made many years ago in serendipitously in, in experiments that we said, oh. Could it be that animals that are exposed to an enriched environment become more different? And yeah, if you look at, at different parameters, you can see that, that this is the case. Here is, for example, spatial exploration. And uh, you can see that, um, that animals become less, uh, that, that the variance um, in the enriched group here in the second trial in the spatial exploration it becomes larger. And also the range of how, how well they habituate to speak. The object of exploration, there's an effect on both the mean and on the variance. So it seems that when, if very simple experiment is done, genetically identical animal, put them in a larger cage, don't do anything else, you get a difference between the groups. But you also get a difference within the enriched group. That doesn't apply to any everything. So, so when you look at um, here, for example, the the the, uh, the, the learning of, of the task the ob object recognition um, itself in the enriched group here, it's, it missed significance. But most of the time, you get a significant effect if you would would do that. But, but the point is, there's certainly no not as the variance is, is big in both. Uh, cases, so so it, it doesn't uh, seem to be uh, uh, generalizable, and that's that's all true. If you look at morphology in these animals, you can see here hippocampus, uh, all kinds of submeasures. Um, sometimes, case of dentic gyrus, you find a mean difference, perhaps a tendency for a, a variance effect. But interestingly, especially considering the, 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 the behavioral tasks that we, that we saw, there is an effect on variance in the motor cortex. So it, it, it seems that enrichment does something to the brain, but it doesn't do that in a simple, consistent way. So we'll further look at, um, and, and, and these particular measures in the brain, they were interesting because many of the old papers by Marion Diamond and some of her colleagues, they have always looked at um, cortical measures, thickness and then distances. They, they didn't have the tools that we would have today to measure all this, but they, they spent quite some uh, um, uh, effort on, on trying to understand how brain morphology changes. And we can go through the body and, and, and look at other parameters here as adrenal glands, uh, weights, uh, whatever, uh, various things. And you, you, you see sometimes there is an effect, sometimes there isn't, sometimes it's only on the mean, sometimes it's on the variance. And so if you plot this um, in, in, in such a matrix, uh, correlations of, of these various uh, parameters, um, you see that um, Enrichment on the right changes the correlation patterns of all these things, um, which indicates that the patterns are not uniform. There is enrichment just doesn't simply change everything in the same direction. There's 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 uh, there are differences, right? and and this is interesting because the genetics are constant. And the environment is constant as well, because we have only put them in the same cage and the animals have done what might make them different. different. 
No, so, so we see, see that there, there are quite a number of differences coming up. But there's also literature um, which says, well, there, there is not. This is a paper that came out uh, uh, two years ago and uh, from, from a large uh, um, effort done at the German Mouse Clinic in, um, in, uh, in Munich. Pretty big study. And they looked at, um, at uh, all the parameters that um, the, the um, German Mouse Clinic offers. And, and then they, they, they come to the conclusion in, the, in this uh, paper that environmental enrichment does not um, affect variability. So the, 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 the message of that paper is you can use your standardized uh, experiments and uh, you can even give the animals a little bit of enrichment in the cage, which is of good, good for reasons of animal welfare. But you will not jeopardize uh, your results because there is no effect on you don't increase your risk of uh, um, suffering power of your experiment by increasing variance. But if you look at the data in that paper, this is the influence of the main factors, which would be the enrichment here, but they also looked at sex and the court, on the coefficient of variance. And these uh, colors, uh, they, 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 they mean that there are actually different these dots. This is the reply. And, and, and you wonder, the first two columns are the, the enrichment effect. And you wonder, hey, this looks like quite a bit of change, actually. So how can you say it's not? And so, so despite what the paper says in the abstract and the conclusion section, I think it, it nicely supports um, our, our statement um, that exposure to enriched environment, and in this case, this is a tiny bit of environmental enrichment. They have a little house in their cage and a little bit of more nesting material. That's all. And this is sufficient in such a condition to in increase variance. Granted, quite moderately in this study, but as you can see from this graph alone, there is. So my interest is one of, where I come from is adult neurogenesis and that's a particular type of brain plasticity in uh, the adult brain. It affects only one single neuronal connection between the dental gyrus and CA3 which is a mossy fiber connection and you know this classical trisynaptic circuit which connects enterhinal cortex and the input from all the sensory regions. Why are these uh, connections filtering and compressing station of dental gyrus, the auto association and CA3, and then the uh, output via the subiculum from CA1 into a cortex where information is actually stored. And, and, and adult neurogenesis contributes this one connection. So it's a very particular type of plasticity. And so we have looked at adult neurogenesis in enriched environments for many years. We also looked in this study, and as you can see in, in, in this third panel here, it's one of these phenotypes where, where this dual effect is, 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 is massive. It's, uh, you have a very strong mean effect, but you also have a very strong effect on variance. And you, can, you can see in this experiment, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a threefold, or actually depending on how you can be a tenfold difference in, in the extremes between animals in the control conditions and the enriched conditions. But there's also animals which are in the enriched conditions, but they don't differ much from the, from the controls. So the production of new neurons in a structure that is required for learning is one of these um, phenotypes that are different um, in both in, in two ways. One, um, there's a mean effect, and there's also effect in variance. And we think that these uh, new neurons, they contribute to the adaptation of the hippocampus to certain functional needs because they change how the hippocampus can respond to the environment. So they change the environment, the, the behavior of the animal, and that feeds back to adult neurogenesis, regulates it. It also changes, however, the environment, the experience and the learning from the environment, and that has yet another effect. So, so that there's a dual feedback loop um, between adult neurogenesis and behavior in the environment. So it's, it's a way of responding to the environment. 
And that makes it, of course, particularly interesting if you study enriched environments. Um, could that be a mechanism that is, um, that is uh, uh, very central? That's one line of the research. But on the other hand, this is also a great readout because it's a, it's, it's a structural readout, but that is very close to function. And um, as uh, Sarah has already mentioned in the introduction, this is a project that has really um, originated in life. Um, and um, this, uh, the, this, this, the student who did the first um, project on this uh, individuality uh, experiments um, or, uh, that, that we did, um, Julia Freund, she has been a life um, fellow. And um, I, I will never forget, I gave one talk in, in, in life many, many years ago where we first introduced uh, this idea. It was really not much more than an idea. Yeah, it could, there was some data already, but it was, it was really vague. And um, uh, uh, John Nessel wrote was, was in the audience. <laughs> he, he came up with this paper. And I mean, it's, it's a completely obscure paper. And it's still to this day, one of the few papers that we have ever found that in history has looked at this effect. And I, I, I don't know how he could uh, possibly find this in, uh, in, his, uh, uh, in his head, uh, because this is really obscure. But it's, it's, it, for our purpose, this is a great um, paper. And he knew it and he, he pointed it out uh, to us. And um, it, it, it says here, down here, these results establish that stable and relatively permanent complex individual differences of the sort often assumed to be genetically determined can be generated by the appropriate manipulation of experience during early life. And so here, here comes this uh, all uh, together that um, we have an experience, we can control genetics in our case, um, and we have a hypothesis, in this case also to the learning mechanism itself that we can study. So the idea then is that we can turn the enriched environment to a paradigm that does something that is a bit different. We can ask the phenotype, how the phenotype looks under the conditions that the genotype and the environment are kept constant, but it's not the whole environment that is kept constant because we are looking at those, that proportion of the, of the um, environment which is called the shared environment and shared is everything that comes from the outside. That is sort of the environment out there, what, what we normally would consider the environment. But there's actually a component of environmental ex uh, um, of environment that has to do with how we respond to that environment, how we live in that environment, and our own activity in that environment. Uh, and, and so we can return to this um, and, and come up with this different look at this environmental enrichment paradigm. And we can take it, make it longitudinal and multivariate, but we can also make it individual. We can ask under such highly constrained conditions, what is it that makes mice different? And because we can control so much, we have a chance of getting down to very fundamental mechanisms. And that's the relationship between the introduction and, and the real work we are doing. Right? Of course, this G factor in this lifestyle circle that I showed you in the beginning, that, that's much larger, that's much grander than the, that what we can achieve here. But it's the same principal idea that you reduce the complexity. And even a mouse life in the cage is quite complex. And, and you can, can reduce it to, 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 to some very fundamental measures and use that as an experimental paradigm to learn something about the rules that underlie this. So we have to have a different type of enriched environment. And this is the Buckingham Palace style enriched environment. Uh, Buckingham Palace has 700 rooms. So our cage uh, system also has not 700, but 70 rooms. And um, this is the no a normal cage rack. These are the little um, cages where these um, animals normally live, uh, a few miles uh, per cage. And um, the trick of this cage is that these cages are all connected. You can see that already here. Um, so between these two racks, there is always connections. And there's connections between the cages on one level and uh, between the levels. And you can, um, we can see that here on the left, the mouse can, can, can roam between two adjacent cages and it can go uh, 
to the next uh, layer and to the next. You can see that a little bit better down here, right? There's um, these connections and um, these connections between the layers. And you also see that there are these black um, rings around these connection tubes. And these are antennas, ring antennas. And um, the mice, they when they come into the experiment, they get an, a, a, a transponder injected under the skin and the neck. Um, the transponder is a little bit bigger than a, a grain of rice, uh, so it's very small and um, it doesn't impair the animals at all. And this is the same system, uh, radio frequency I, I, I identity identification system, which um, uh, is the same thing as supermarket, right? When you didn't get the tag removed from your from the whatever you bought. And then there's an alarm, but here it's not an alarm, but um, the ID of the animal is uh, sent to the central computer and stored. So we have temporal spatial resolution for a long, long time, in this case, three months, for every single animal we know where they have been at any time. And um, when, when, when you do that with these animals, you, 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 you see an interesting thing, and it fits what we, what we um, said so far. Well, first, the, the, the animals habituate a little bit. So, so you can see that um, between nights there are huge differences, but the, but the activity um, overall goes a bit down. They, they, they habituate a bit. But if you look at, um, at, uh, at variance, um, there is an increase. So, so the, the activity becomes more different. And um, this, this suggests that um, animals might be on, on very different behavioral uh, trajectories um, uh, here, and they might become more and more different, also in the sense of their behavior. And um, in the paper from 2013, um, um, we have plotted it uh, uh, this way, the spaghetti plot uh, uh, type of thing. This is um, a um, parameter which um, Andreas Brandmeier from the MPI in, in, in Berlin uh, came up with uh, after discussion that Ulman Lindenberger and uh, student uh, Julia and Andreas and I had um, as a way of collapsing all this information of the behavior of, of, this, uh, of these antennas. At that time it was a slightly different cage but the principle is the same um, in, in, into one number. And the roaming entropy that is uh, meant here describes um, behavioral activity. Um, it's it's a it's a it's a measure of um, well, it's a, it's a, it quantifies the probability of a mouse to be found at any place in this cage. So if if, if the, the roaming entropy is high, it means that you have a good chance of finding the mouse uh, anywhere where you you, you check. And um, a mouse that would uh, only switch between two cages all the time might be physically very active, but the chance to meet her somewhere else outside these two cages is very low, so roaming entropy is low. So you could, cons you could take this also as a measure of territorial coverage, but also by some extension as a measure of exploration, so or of active environment with active interaction with the environment. And so, if if you plot these um, these um, measures of, of of roaming entropy of this interaction with the environment in in, in in this way, this was done by in four bins here, so that it's it's a bit smoothened for the curves. But you 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 can see that these trajectories uh, diverge a bit, and it's given away by the color um, code already here that animals in this highest uh, category of the cumulative roaming entropy, they have the most adult levels of highest levels of adult neurogenesis, and the same can, of course, be depicted a bit more mathematically. And you can see that the coefficient of determination is, 20, is 0 0.22, so that means that 22% in the variation of adult neurogenesis can be explained with these differences in, in roaming entropy. So that means that we have a parameter that is related to brain plasticity, which correlates very highly or sufficiently highly with 
a behavioral trajectory at the level of the individual so that, that we can say, well, there is good reason to hypothesize that there is also a causal relationship here, at least in the sense that we can derive a good hypothesis here that there is something in the behavior that changes the brain so that yeah that the hippocampus becomes different in these individuals. So I've done more experiments um, of, uh, of, of, of this type. This is a study which went for, for six months. Um, it's actually just uh, accepted uh, for publication, so it's not just in the bio anymore, so it's, it's coming out. And um, so six months of enrichment, and the idea of, at after three months, you take half of the animals out and, and ask, um, are the effects lasting? And um, you, one thing you can already see, if you see the controls are the green line here, and um, this is just the body weight, and uh, because the animals are very small, when they get in, they get more heavier. And animals that are living in an enriched environment, they are more active, um, they eat perhaps a little less, so they are leaner, and you can see that the enriched curve is consistently below. And those animals that experience a withdrawal, they are with the enriched animals until the withdrawal, and then with it, they return to control levels. So body weight, for example, is not maintained. And um, yeah, we have uh, uh, seen this uh, kind of the two phases, um, and uh, there's this de decrease in, in, in mean activity, there's an increase in, in, in the variance. You can look at these individual trajectories. Here we had a few more time blocks, but that's just for visualization. And you can, can see down here um, that uh, there is an increase in, in this panel here. You can see there's a constant increase in the inter individual variance, but it seems that with then this effect on variation uh, actually plateaus. But if you look at correlations between these timers, you can see that the correlation increasingly um, increases, which means that the behavior over time becomes more and more stable and predictable, as, as it said, also says in this uh, measure um, um, down here. So now when we look at adult neurogenesis in this um, a paradigm, we gave an injection of this label that we use um, at the three-month time point. And remember the three-month time point, all animals in both enrichment groups, they were in the enriched environment, so they shouldn't show any difference. But the measurement actually took place three months later at the end of the experiment. So, so we are looking at neurons that were born at three months, but they were still there at six months. Right? And that means that newborn cells from that three month time point, they are still there at six months. And we see the effect that we have seen repeatedly. There is an effect on the mean and enrichment, and that this effect is lasting. But there's also an effect on the variance, and this effect on the variance is also lasting. That means in terms of the enriched environment and with respect to these new neurons, there is an individualization effect, and this effect is lasting even after withdrawal. So the hippocamp, the early exposure changes the brain for long, for good, for example, let's say at least for three months. Now there's a second measurement with a, a, a second label at six months and now we are looking at cells that were born at the end of this period and you can see that the enriched period the en 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 enriched animals on values are lower now because we are later and there's a physiological decline there is still a mean effect there's also still an effect on the variance but as in the other experiments some animals don't distinguish themselves anymore from, from the standard housing. But those animals that have returned to standard housing conditions after three, uh, uh, after three months, they are indistinguishable, both in terms of the individualizing effect and in terms of the mean. So that suggests that, yes, you gain from what you experienced early, but this individualization effect, it doesn't keep going. 
it, it, it returns on you. So it seems that the mice need this um, exposure. Um, and again, as, as, as we have seen, um, that there is this uh, small but meaningful correlation between. Can look at um, other um, uh, uh, relationships um, between um, uh, between phenotypes. For example, simple locomotion, and uh, you can see in that uh, panel um, here, um, there is no um, stable behavior in in in, in the groups. Um, Whereas when we look at, ex for example, object exploration as one of the paradigms where we know there is a, a strong individualization, we see that there is a development of inter-individual stability. So it means that, that this exposure to the enriched environment in this individuality paradigm affects different, para different parameters differently. And in some, we develop these stable trajectories that are lasting in others, we don't. And um, this already calls for uh, immediately for the idea that there, there must be something going on, at, perhaps at the level of epigenetics, uh, because you need something that mediates lasting effects. How there's no other way um, that the, ex, the environmental um, uh, effect or the exposure to that um, uh, environment and that. Um, activity um, effect can last unless there is some effect on the regulation at the transcription level, and that's epigenetics. And um, Zara Zocher also has been a life um, uh, uh, fellow for, for for many years. Um, she has uh, uh, done the epigenetics work in this uh, study that that's uh, coming out. So again, the paradigm. On the top, and she looks at DNA methylation, and DNA methylation is a measure of the activatability of, of, of genes. And so, if the methylation pattern changes, it means that the genes become activatable by a stimulus or whatever, um, or not. And um, there's different uh, uh, locations where this um, can happen, and that's why it's distinguished here between CPG. CPH methylation, but the idea is the same. It's, it's, it's changes in this methylation of the DNA so that the, the gene can be transcribed or not. And what you can see is that an exposure to enriched environments has a very strong effect on the distribution of this methylation. You know, there's the violin plots, they, 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 they represent the distribution. And you can see that in uh, in control conditions, you have this um, um, bottle shape, um, thick belly. Um, most methylation is sort of medium methylation um, level. And um, in the case of exposure to an enriched environment, this shifts towards this um, base shape or this different um, shape with a much higher. Um, proportion of, of, of complete methylation, but the, the key point here is not exactly what this is. I'm not going into the details of the study that then looks at the details of this, um, but the point is that the enrichment, the two enrichment groups don't differ. So that means that the methylation changes, they are lasting. Right? You, can, you might uh, be tempted to think that gets a little bit thicker here again, becoming a bit more like standard, but the, the, the pattern still holds. So there is a lasting effect at the epigenetic level. And here it becomes even clearer, right, whereas a demethylation effect at the CPH location, right, also this uh, medium normal condition, and then both cases you get a drop in methylation. So it means that this um, paradigm is also associated with lasting effects at the um, genetic uh, level or epigenetic level. That means that um, when we keep constant the shared environment um, and the genome, then we get differences in the effect 
of the non-shared um, environment and on, 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 on various uh, phenotypes because of the difference in the non-shared environment and, and these ref are reflected in partially lasting and partially uh, non-lasting effects and we can even trace them down to the epigenetics level. Now if you think about it that of course means also that it's not fully true anymore that the, that we keep the uh, um, shared environment constant because if there are these differences in behavior there's all kinds of changes in social structure and things going on presumably and they of course affect other animals as well so their environment changes when the individual behaves differently and so there's a twist um, here that uh, extends the non-shared environment into the shared environment <coughs> something that would be nice to explore so how does it work um, and um, what can we ultimately perhaps say about such uh, common uh, mechanisms uh, we use uh, roaming entropy and neurogenesis as 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 fundamental um, mechanisms here and but but what is the context? Um, and the context is 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 clear that mechanistically, this is uh, fairly complicated because we have an environmental effect that somehow must work all its way down from the organism through the brain, systems level, network cell to the DNA. And because we get a change in um, in uh, gene regulation, um, we ultimately get an effect on on behavior and um, so we have to go all the way out um, again so this is this idea that we have uh, nested mechanisms in this russian doll type um, uh, approach you can you can look at that uh, slightly more uh, complex way it's the same idea that you have these layered um, uh, these, these layers and and you have an inward causality from the environment towards the gene and you have an outward causality from the genotype towards uh, the behavior and um and and both determine of course this individualization effect um and the expo the effect of the enriched environment and they they you, you could say that they of course meet everywhere but but a phenotype like enriched environment in a uh, circumscribed um a system like the hippocampus with something like adult neurogenesis um, at, at hand that, that that's a very um, elegant way of, of trying to capture this right? it, might, it might be easier than to do that um, at, at, than, than at the level of the whole brain or something although we try this um, as well in, in some of the more recent studies and we try to relate it all the way from social interaction down to the genome and, and vice versa so let me summarize for you that um, what I've showed you is that a new or refined version of the enriched environment paradigm gives us an experimental paradigm to study the neurobiology of individuality and um, that adult neurogenesis is a concrete example of some neurobiological reserve mechanism where we can study some of the neurobiological mechanisms that might underlie reserve formation in the individual and um, that the these longitudinal multivariate implementations of the enriched environment they expose this non-shared environment under the conditions that we keep genes and environment constrained and uh, adult neurogenesis and what i've shown you is, is an individualizing trait so it, it, it might help understand an exemplary way but but still how we become different and how we become who we are. Um, yeah, this uh, is my, my group at present. This was the first case after three months that we got together to celebrate the first PhD defense after the shutdown. Uh, um, so uh, the people who are listed on the on the right um, and in, 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 in uh, and both fonts are the ones that contributed to the studies that I've shown to you today. And uh, I especially have to mention Zara Zoha, who did most of the work I've uh, presented to you today with, to, together with uh, Susan Schilling. And Anna Zip and Rupert Overall did well of the 
um, the work um, on the analysis and getting the data out of the cages and um, Jaji uh, Bogada Lopez has uh, taken on this experiment and she's taking this whole paradigm um, to level up from the behavior from from the looking at the dark neurogenesis but looking at whole brain um, um, changes and she has contributed a lot to these uh, studies by doing all these behavioral uh, works. I don't have them on the slide here, but I should of course mention that without Ulman Lindenberger and Andreas Brandmeier, who gave uh, the 2012 or whenever that visit to Berlin was when we came up with this idea of how to analyze this mass of data and uh, this uh, roaming entropy as a capturing a behavior in this cage uh, uh, came out. Um, this would all not have been possible. So this is, uh, as Sarah mentioned, really a brainchild of life, uh, if you will. So the funding that we're getting is from the German Center for Neurodegenerative Disease, DZNE. And um, so we are a member of the Helmholtz Association. And I'm also at the University in Dresden at the Center for Regenerative Therapies. And uh, I would like to thank you for your attention today. And um, I think we have some time for questions. Yeah, I saw already that there's first chat things coming in. Happy to take your questions. Thanks. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Gerd. Uh, now you have to imagine thunderous applause that we unfortunately <laughs> can give you. Um, we are now going to um, have questions. Um, the first question is going to be asked by Colleen Frank. Um, so go ahead, Colleen. Hi, Colleen. Hi, thank you so much for the talk. It was really interesting. Um, I have a question about, so the withdrawal condition, have you ever done it the opposite way where they start off in the control and then you move them to the enriched? And if so, what do you find? And if not, what, what do you predict would happen? The delayed uh, condition, right, uh, where you would say that um, the others get a head start. No, we haven't yet done that, um, but it's a, it's an interesting way um, of looking at it. Um, it just requires m much more work on the controls, um, and uh, the power goes down, of course, <laughs> because you increase already. And so, so that's why we haven't done it yet. But um, one can generalize your question even a little bit and um, and ask what is it that um, determines what's going on in the very first period, right? Is it the more experience you have already gathered before this starts, um, how much is that determining the response, right? And that's a, that's a very cool question, a very important question, and um, you can tackle it in different ways and uh, perhaps it might be more promising to first try to manipulate it in a targeted way than what you're suggesting. But of course, ultimately, it's, 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 it's a good way of doing it because uh, when you have an understanding of this, this will be very informative. Yeah, thanks. Okay, next question is by Sarah Polk. Hi, Sarah. Yeah, hi. Um, I have kind of, I guess a overall question, maybe also asking your opinion. Um, what are then the implications of this individuality? I mean, you have such a controlled environment, you have controlled genes, everything is controlled down to the like most minute detail. What are implications for human studies then? Because I mean, we, we also wanna see how individual differences develop and stuff like this, but I mean, genetics are out of our control. The environment is largely out of our control. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe just your opinion on what implications the, the mouse work has for this. Yeah, of course, it has massive implications. No, it's, <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is a very important question, of course. Um, and um, we believe that we, with this kind of paradigm, we can, we can understand certain um, fundamental mechanisms, which mm -hmm. are also existing in humans because they are evolutionarily conserved and important but mm -hmm. when you look at humans they will be much more diluted so so humans will add layers and layers of complexity to this but because of this you will never see them 
and you you, uh, you have a diff much more difficulties in this case to look all the way through these layers that I showed you. So if, and it, 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 it's it's a really big if, if we manage to come up with clever understandings of of, of how this this layered cake might actually work, then we might develop better ideas of how it also works in humans, although the effect sizes and the actual contribution to certain particular questions becomes reduced. But it, when you look at this literature on this reserve uh, uh, stuff, for example, it's 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 highly suggestive of of, of being a fundamental mechanism principle. Mm -hmm. But we understand extremely little mechanistically because we have no way of looking at that in, in humans. I mean, mechanistically, mm -hmm. in the sense of going down to genes and cells. Right? Of course, mechanisms yeah. also exist in other layers. And and if if we have a have a model that that might help us understand common principles, for example, understanding what does just the mere fact that the, that somebody a mouse behaves runs around so dissecting all these facts that might help us in getting a handle on that we might then perhaps find better ways of finding this one parameter also in complex human data sets mm. but it's a promise i don't know uh, if uh, if we will be successful but um uh, if we don't do it then we will continue trying to infer from the human data to the mechanism and that's as dangerous as if i say uh, oh it's <laughs> this is a solution right that's why i think we have to meet uh, somewhere in the middle and that's why i i'm happy to be in life because this is one of the places where that takes place in an institutionalized way and we are the odd people working with mice but but still the topics you you share in, in, in often not all <laughs> many of you share Mm. Yeah, thank you. Okay, great. Uh, we're now already opening uh, the questions to the audience, and the first audience question comes from Minakshi Pardasani. Hi, uh, can you hear? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, thanks for the great talk. Uh, so my question is, uh, are there certain fields or behavioral characteristics for which, uh, rather than the individual differences that you talked about, uh, the effect is significantly different between the males and the females? Well, the are there is, those the certain phenotypes that you had? We cannot study males. Hmm. This is the challenge for... for uh, so? Separately. We cannot study males because... Um, um, males are territorial, and uh, so the cage size is not sufficient. You, get, you, you increase a lot of variability, but, but uh, by, okay, a, okay. by means of a very So your results are based on the female mice? They are all on the females. Uh, there is ways to get around this, okay. and we are currently planning an experiment okay. with males. Unfortunately, we have okay. so far that solved that. But it will be very interesting. So you, you would and need larger cages? Yeah, there's some other things yeah. you also have to control. For, yeah, a lot of the case control for a couple of things that they come from same litters and so so to avoid that they uh, just fight, which is is I mean, mm -hmm. you get interesting yeah. results probably, but the interpretation will be very difficult. And Sarah would say, well, this is even less relevant. I mean, human males also fight, but not to this extent. Yeah, because I'm also working on enrichment, but with males right now. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, it having, works. Uh, the individual it, but... differences that I see is are there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But 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 is, how is your experience? Do you do you often see that um, you get huge differences because the alpha male has a lot of uh, different. Not huge. Other? No, not so huge. Not so huge. But I'm using bigger cages. So yeah. I think that accounts for that. Yeah, yeah. yeah there's it, it, there are there ways around it, and we are now do, trying it. But uh, we, so far we haven't. And of course, mixed okay, population would be even more interesting, but then we get yeah. another layer of yes. complexity. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Okay, the, the next question comes from um, Adam Nelson. Adam, can you hear us? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Uh, thanks for the talk. It was really interesting. Um, my question concerns about making 
manipulations to neurogenesis in the mice in the enriched environment. And I'm wondering if you could block neurogenesis, would that coerce um, animals to become of a particular phenotype? Okay. Um, and it seems like the prediction might be that if you were to block, you know, say in a subset of animals, uh, neurogenesis, hopefully in, in um, the hippocampus specifically, that would, um, I guess the prediction would be that those animals would be the low roaming entropy animals. Have you done anything like that? Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, it's it's not yet published. It's also not finished. It's it's very preliminary. But in the one study we did with one genetic model that el eliminates quite selectively, I, I cannot claim that it's 100%. And that's the reason why we need more experiments. Um, when you abolish adult neurogenesis, you inhibit the development of the trajectories. But this is really preliminary. But but I this is this is the hypothesis that drives me now to continue and, and think that there's really some causality in there. I don't think that it's all. So we have to we need more analyses there, also more phenotyping that we can describe the situation even better than now. Um, but uh, for the experiment as we did it, this was the result. Okay, the next question comes from Ulman Lindenberger. Ulman, can you hear us? Hello, Gerd, can you hear me? Hey, Ulman. Hey, Ulman. Great. Yeah, a wonderful presentation as always. I have a question regarding, I think, the last part of your outlook slide, which refers to the notion of uh, reserve. And um, so the idea that adult neurogenesis may act uh, as, a, as a cognitive reserve. And of course, we would love to translate this into human work or into the human situation to some extent. And I think the question I have is uh, how old or young actually are the mice with whom you are doing the experiments that you talked about, such as a, a point and I, but also the, the current data. And if we then were to let these mice become really old, uh, would it be would it be kind of a, a mean level effect such that they carry the uh, uh, the the greater amount of uh, adult neurogenesis and also the greater amount of individual differences in a constant manner into old age, such that it does not really affect the rate of aging, but rather gives them a better start into yeah. aging, so to say, or would it actually uh, affect uh, uh, maintenance, so to say, would yeah. they age less, so to say. Yeah. And of course, there is an analog to that in the human literature, and that's with education, where the data seem to suggest that education gives you a higher level as a, as a young adult, um, and therefore also an advantage for old age, but that advantage is not so much an effect that is, uh, is about the rate of change, uh, the rate of decline, as it is about having a higher level uh, a, as a young adult. Yeah, it's exactly what, what I would love to do. And the experiments that I've shown you today are really preparational for this uh, study. Um, but I mean, a mouse in captivity gets two years, uh, two and a half years old. Um, so if you really want to get into a range where you can talk about aging in, in real sense, not aging in the sense of passing time, this is a long experiment. And the one that I showed you today with this withdrawal effect, where we try to look at uh, lasting effects, was meant as a first step in that direction. I'm asking, um, is there anything that, um, what is it with the stability? And and we also saw there that this individualization effect seems to plateau off a little bit. So perhaps mm -hmm. for that study, it would be good to increase the scope of experience even further so that we can mm -hmm. further spread the, um, uh, the, the animals. Um, but then this is exactly what I would love to do. And, and the distinction that you are making, I, I, did, I glossed over this in my first slide, there's of course a discussion on is so, so reserve is the uh, the intercept and uh, maintenance is the, mm. the, the slope mm. of the curve and and this kinds uh, um, the, the, there are ideas that uh, 
in, in a very reductionistic way you can test with this model. Yeah, I agree. And, and that's what we, uh, of course, want, want to do Super. with you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Um, I actually did have exactly the same question as Oman did. Um, <laughs> and we are also running out of time. So I think this is an excellent point uh, maybe to close today's session. And uh, I want to again thank uh, Gerd Kempermann for the wonderful talk uh, and the really interesting data that you showed us. Um, exactly some <laughs> else. And let everyone know that next week Daniel Bassett is going to speak. So see you all next week and thanks again, Gerd. Thank you for having me. Bye bye. Bye.